Our headline interview today, Admiral Sir Tony Radekin has been head of the UK's armed forces since November last year. Now he's in charge of steering Britain's military response at a time of intense global crisis. Speaking exclusively to this programme tonight, he's extremely frank about Vladimir Putin's faltering new offensive in Ukraine and the future state of the MOD's budget. With a significant part of the Russian army now concentrated on the Donbass offensive, we started by me asking him whether Russia will succeed in its aim of encircling Ukraine's forces there. It's possible. I think the, the thing that we've learned just after a couple of months is a truism about war, that when you unleash this thing called war, it is incredibly unpredictable as to then what happens. It can have its plans to, um, to focus on the Donbass, to try for encirclement, but then you are seeing a Ukraine that responds every time. There are real risks that Russia could gain some ground, but you're also seeing on a daily basis Russia struggling to get the momentum, struggling to align its air forces with its land forces, struggling to get uh, what we call a modern campaign, which, which creates that momentum that means that it's got an unstoppable force. And you don't see that improving over the days? You don't see the Russians having learned from their mistakes around Kyiv? I think it's really hard to make those improvements in the short space of time between their defeat in, around the cities, and we're talking severe um, impact on their armed forces. You had 25% of, of, of their forces um, effectively being taken out, either through uh, people being killed or through the damage to, to their battalion tactical groups. What we're now seeing is incredible pressure, political pressure for a victory and military pressure for a victory. We've got to wait and see whether or not doing that in such a rushed manner against a Ukrainian armed forces that are fighting for their country and a Ukrainian armed forces that we're proud to be saying that we're supporting, that should give all of us encouragement about how this is going to be a tough fight uh, and, it, and it's going to carry on being a tough fight. This is going to be hard slog. What do you think the extent of Vladimir Putin's ambitions are now in Ukraine? I think his ambitions remain the same as they were on the 24th of February. It was always to take the whole of Ukraine, put it under different leadership, and then he's the master of all he surveys. He's failed. He, he's, he's failed in that. Even if he was to take the Donbass, even if he was to have a stronger control of the South, the Ukrainian people are never going to fall under Russia. They have shifted to the West. He's also failed in that he's made, he's made NATO stronger. It's failure on failure. And then you're seeing the tactical fight where he's trying to rush to a tactical victory and then, and then he'll push that with his own people. Could he be limited by the amount of missile supplies he's got left to the point eventually he can't cope up this level of intensity? He potentially has a problem. The rate of expenditure and the toughness of the fight is totally different to the one that he perceived on the 24th of February. I think there are several wars going on. There's a tactical geographical war going on in Ukraine. There's a logistics war going on in terms of how do you maintain that rate of expenditure of, of all of your And that uh, can't ammunition. last much longer, in your view? So I don't, again, I don't, want to, I don't want to say what our analysis is of, 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 of where we are in, in those wars. We've got to see it in this big, big sense of a global campaign and Russia is losing in all of those wars. Let me ask you about Victory Day in Moscow on Monday. Big parade coming out, a lot of big statements expected from Vladimir Putin. One thing that uh, some people think he might do is parade prisoners of war through Red Square. Obviously a breach of the Geneva Convention, but uh, two prisoners in particular are British, Aidan Aslan and Sean Pinnock. If he did that, if he paraded British soldiers, what would be your reaction? We've got no evidence that, um, that we anticipate something like that is the first point. The second point would be it would just follow on with the sort of disgracefulness that we've seen in this campaign. And, 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 and I mean the, the shocking way that Russia has prosecuted this campaign in, in a much bigger way than parading uh, prisoners of war. It's the way that they've committed war crimes. It's the way that they've adopted the tactics of Chechnya and Syria to rubberize cities. The correct thing for Russia to do is to bring this war to an end, to acknowledge that actually what it needs is a ceasefire. What it needs is to, is to withdraw. What it needs is to respect Ukraine's sovereignty. Let me ask you a little bit about Britain's role in the war. Obviously, we've been doing an awful lot to supply Ukraine's armed forces. 
Have there been any British military personnel on the ground in Ukraine since the invasion on February the 24th? So there have uh, in terms of supporting our diplomatic effort. How about supporting supplies, logistics, training Ukrainians? We've restricted our, our military support on the ground to supporting our diplomatic effort. So if you remember that was um, like lots of embassies shifting from Kyiv to Lviv and then the logistics support training effort uh, is being done in the UK, it's being done in other countries uh, and that's where our focus is. Russia's invasion has signified a major paradigm shift in terms of our security, especially obviously with relations to Russia. Does the defence budget need an increase to reflect that? There might, there might be, but that's, that's a conversation that we need to have in, in a much bigger way. That's a taking stock of what is the impact of this? What is the impact of Russia's aggression? The integrated review was more than just security. So it was, a, it was a traditional review in the sense of it was it aligned foreign policy with security, but then it also aligned other aspects. It tried to speak to this nation's ambition in terms of a prosperity agenda. So some of those big headline aspects, I think, have been shown to be right. We're just over two months into a war in Europe. We have to look at that. We have to be humble to say, right, what's changed? What is tactical? What might have affirmed what we said in the integrated review? Where might we need to adjust? And then, and then we need to have that conversation. In an ideal world, I would want the whole of NATO to be meeting its 2% target. Yeah, what about the UK? I want, I want the UK to be leading that, and I want the UK to be really clear of the importance of that. And then if you ask me, as a selfish military officer, could we provide more to the nation in terms of its security with additional spending, then of course... That's, that's something that I would welcome. Let me ask you something pretty related to this, uh, and that's inflation, which could well soon hit uh, 10%. Are you worried about the effect inflation will have on the defence budget? Because you've committed already to spending so much, those prices now have dramatically gone up. I think like everybody, uh, we're worried about the impact of inflation. So I think that's a personal worry, that's a professional worry, and then there's a departmental worry. And then there's a, there's a responsibility that says, right, how do we manage that? So does that mean in an inflation era, do you try and bring some of that spending forward? And do you try and spend your money more quickly? Does that mean that you prioritise some areas because they're more important than others? Let's focus on the money that we've got and, and get the most out of that. And then let's have a separate conversation about has the threat changed? And, and is there an argument for, for, for more money for defence? And this is what it would mean for the nation and the government. There are worries out there that if defence spending doesn't increase, you get more cash in then our spending is going to drop below 2% uh, of the NATO budget. You share those worries. I think the government's been clear that it supports the 2% figure. That's not my question. Do you and share those worries? Because those are the worries of the So at the, moment, at the moment, under this spending review, we're above 2% through the, through the whole period of the spending review. And then what you're seeing is it, it, it starts to peter off, I think, in 24, 25. And then that's the subject beyond that. That's then the subject of another spending review. The trajectory then is it's above 2%, and then it gets really close, staying above 2% in about 24, 25. And then that needs to be a fresher conversation because actually the ambition of this government is to stay above 2%. A fresh conversation means if we don't get some more money, we're going to drop below 2%. At the moment, beyond the current spending review period, right. that's where we would go. We but could, in because this as you know, the Defence Secretary has written to the Chancellor, we believe, <coughs> to make that precisely that warning. We're a big spending department and we have regular conversations at all levels with the Treasury. And... The Defence Secretary writing to the Chancellor to say this is our view of where defence spending is going I think is pretty normal business. Are we involved in the same conversations and do I support the Defence Secretary as, as the head of a big spending department writing to a fellow Cabinet Minister as the Chancellor and is that normal? Um, then absolutely. One final question for you. Your thoughts on the, this Sunday as the nation here marks VE Day? What we really revere is those veterans and their sacrifice for our country and what they achieved and the values that they were fighting for. And can we follow in their footsteps? And that's what we're doing with Ukraine. Can we stand up for those values? Can we keep our own nation safe? Can we keep our friends in Ukraine as safe as possible? And can we try to ensure that we have some 
security, some stability, and can we look for increased prosperity, which our previous generations enabled us to, to fortunately have. Admiral, thanks so much for talking to me. Thanks for coming on the news desk. Thank you very much, Tom.